This episode is brought to you by Peak, the blockchain for real-world applications and home of DPIN. If you think it's time for Web3 to get real, check out their website at peak.network. That's P-E-A-Q dot network. Hello, everyone. Daniel from DPIN Hub over here. And today we have John Gleason, COO of StarJ, one of the first, if not the first, actually, project in deep in space doing decentralized storage. I'm really excited to have you, John, on the episode today because it's a project that I've been following since I think 2017. I, I would say it's the first project that I've been actually mining or like contributing actively on the deep in, on the on crypto in general. Even though I've been in crypto for uh, around 12 years now, but this was the first time that I saw a lot of real utility on the project. And to have you today on the podcast is an honor. Thanks so much for joining. Uh, can we start by you introducing yourself and your background and how you end up at, at Storage A? Sure. So uh, let me just say, hey, thank you for having me on the podcast, uh, right? It, it's always great to find platforms to share the value that DPIN projects are bringing uh, to the world and how really this is, the, this is the new wave of disruption for Web3. So I'm really excited about where we are and, and it's a thrill to be on, on uh, platforms like this to be able to tell the story. So my name is John Gleason. I'm Chief Operating Officer for Storage Labs. I joined Storage in, or I said to call it Storage A. I joined Storage A uh, back in uh, 2017, just after the token sale. And the goal for that the company was to uh, to really bring on um, you know some some people to take that that token sale opportunity to disrupt companies like Amazon. And so we added a you know really use that as an opportunity to invest in the product, invest in the platform, invest in the network, and invest in the people. Um, before Storage, I did just traditional Web two enterprise. Uh, software. So I worked at a company called Covacent. They did industrial IoT and uh, enterprise identity management uh, for companies like Hyundai and uh, GM and Carson Wagon that travel. So really big companies solving big problems with these technology and developer tools and bringing some of that expertise to uh, to storage to help, you know, sort of take it from a really uh, incredible um, feat to make decentralized storage into something that enterprises could use anywhere. Yeah, quite some time, right? Like 20, 2017. Uh, it's been, I can imagine, quite a journey, two or three cycles already on that, on the belt. Uh, you know, it, it's, yeah, it's, it's a lot of interesting stories I'm sure you guys have on the, on the belt for that. Um, can you explain for the users who don't really understand what is a decentralized storage and how does StarJ fit into this ecosystem? Yeah, so decentralized storage broadly just is, is a, sort of a description of storing data on a network of computers and servers that are operated by different people in different places on different networks, different power supplies, right? And creating a, a storage service from infrastructure that you don't own or control. And so there's a lot of challenges in how you uh, approach the problem space. There are many different companies in the space. If you go to uh, Deepin Hub, um, you can see probably half a dozen or more different projects on there. I think the, the, the three main approaches are, are the ones taken by Arweave, Filecoin, and Storage. And so if you look at those three different models, it's one is sort of the forever storage model, right? And so you see this with a lot of NFTs where you can pay once and you store your data forever and it's replicated across a lot of servers that are run by different people. You have models that are like Filecoin where they have actually a marketplace and you choose providers in that marketplace and it's a decentralized marketplace for centralized storage where you store all of your data on multiple providers. And then what storage does is we take 25,000 computers today out there, points of presence and data centers all over the place. We take data and instead of storing it in one place, we store it everywhere. So data is first encrypted with keys our customers have that we don't. So it's secure and private from the network, uh, creating a nice little zero trust layer. And then it's distributed. It's erasure coded, broken up into tiny pieces. And those tiny pieces are distributed across thousands of nodes. And so you have a really efficient way of storing data that's fast and performant. And of course, there's also different different ways to interact with that data. But in general, it's just finding volunteer resources, aggregating them, and creating a storage service on top of it. It's basically the deep in method, right? The deep in way, even way before the, the name existed. Um, I think that's super super interesting. Can you give a little bit about the story behind Storage? A? Like, what motivated the creation of the company, and how it did dif differentiate from like Amazon? Uh, S3 or, or others? Yeah, so the, the origin story is kind of fun. It was back early, 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 you know, just, just when Bitcoin was starting to take off, uh, the storage founder, a guy named Sean Wilkinson, uh, was in his college dorm room and he was trying to do some analysis on the Twitter stream at the time. And what he ran into was 
the to get enough data down to um, to actually do a decent analysis, he didn't have enough capacity, and he didn't have the money to go rent that capacity on Amazon if he wanted a petabyte of storage. And because he was working in Bitcoin at the time, he's like, I wonder if there's a way to do for hard drives what Bitcoin does for uh, compute resources. Because at the time, you could just run Bitcoin on a, a regular computer. Ha, ha, ha. Not anymore. Um, but um, so he built a proof of concept, won a hackathon, turned that into some investment, did a, a crowd sale. All of this kind of led up to the, the token sale. And the big idea was to take this concept in this white paper and turn it into a real usable piece of software. And so the area that where I think we're unique in the deep end projects around storage is that what we looked at was building a storage service that was competitive with Amazon's S3 products. So Amazon S3 was the first object storage to market tool. Pretty much every other provider has adopted the S3 standard. And so there are tens of thousands of applications and hundreds of thousands of businesses out there that all interact with the S3 standard. And we wanted to build a replacement for Amazon S3 that was decentralized. And so that's that's kind of the, the history and ethos. And today what we have is a service that is 80% cheaper than Amazon, 80% lower carbon than Amazon, and also faster than Amazon globally from a single upload. So, I mean, it, it's really amazing to see what you can do with that distributed architecture that DeepBrain brings to the table. And how well it works. I'm like surprised, not surprised, but impressed. Let's say this word is better. How well it's been working for us. Like even as Hotspot or DeepBrain Hub, we are using for a lot of things and we have been stress testing the network as well. Um, we are storing all of our podcast raw files, you know, editing everything. We've been using storage and it's been super fast and super cheap. It's like, okay, there's almost no contender. Uh, everything's worked so well. And one thing that I, I would like to point as well is um, that we discuss a lot on the deep in narrative is that it's kind of like, let's try to do not 100% web three, but more web 2.5, where the actual users, they don't know, or they don't care if you're using a decentralized storage solution, as long as it works well and it's cheap, right? This is the problem that a lot of DPIM projects have is like, how can we onboard new users? And I think you guys are doing like a fantastic job. Like you go to the website, it looks really sleek. I don't really care if it's if it's running on a decentralized storage or not, if it works well. The same way that you don't care if your website goes on AWS or Google Cloud or Amazon Azure, as long as the website works well, that's what you care about, right? Yeah, that is, that is absolutely like kind of where we started, where if the storage isn't good, nobody's going to buy it is, is kind of the the starting point, right? And and honestly, it has to be better than its centralized component or uh, counterpart by a lot uh, in order for somebody to, to take a risk and make a change. One of the interesting things about the, the current market is that with interest rates going up and businesses focusing on, you know, not just top line anymore, but, but the bottom line, one of their biggest um, variable costs is their cloud service costs. And Amazon bills don't go down over time. Like that is, that is sort of one of those truisms, right? And if you can find a solution that is either, you know, on par, right, offers you the same SLA for availability, the same SLA for durability, the table stake stuff, but it's, it's faster, it's cheaper. And what's becoming more important is a lower carbon footprint. People are like, I wouldn't have maybe touched Web3 with a 10 foot pole, in, you know, four or five years ago. Now they're like, I'm sorry, did you say it was cheaper, faster, and just as good on the things I care about? It would be dumb not for me to try this, right? It's not like the, the old days where you, nobody got fired for trying Amazon. Some people are going to get fired if they don't get their Amazon bills under control. And so this is a, a great way to get to that point. And, and DPIN represents really the first net new architecture to be disruptive to that centralized approach, right? Of just building a building, stuffing it full of servers, stuffing the servers full of hard drive, connecting the internet and calling it cloud. Like that's an interesting way to do it. But boy, is that expensive and only... Very few companies can get into that market, but anybody can do what you've done, right? Plug in their computer, run a little agent on it, and share their capacity and earn money and participate in the cloud economy. And when you aggregate that across 25,000 endpoints in 105 different countries, all of a sudden it starts to get really good. Yeah, it's amazing. It, for me, it's a no-brainer to use StarJ. Like it's been, like I said multiple times, it's been really cool to use it and it's been using working so well for us that I'm telling all my friends, everyone is a developer, like, Man, why would you be using Amazon S3? It's so expensive. And there's also the problem that if you touch AWS server, something that costs $20,000 is going to pop up in your bill next month and you have no idea. 
right? I'm always like concerned about that, especially starting Hotspotty as a, a self-funded company. We're very concerned about our like our server costs. You know, like it's coming from my pocket. Uh, and and like you mentioned, the the back compatibility with the Amazon S3 makes things super easy. So, for example, using Cyberduck, which is like FTP software, uh, it's flawless, like super easy to, to connect the, to the star J and then start using as your like external disk. And there's a lot of ways you can do that. Right. I was going to say, we, we see a lot of people using things like Cyberdoc and R clone and, you know, just these basic tools that everybody uses in their workflows and they talk S3, but some of them actually will, will talk the native protocol. And so we have this, we've sort of created this compatibility layer, like you were describing where applications that speak S3 will automatically just work with storage, just like they would with any S3 provider. But there's also um, our S3 uh, compatibility layer talks a native protocol, the storage protocol on the back end, which is a peer to peer uh, transfer network. And what we've seen is there are enterprises who will just simply start with the S3 gateway and go, OK, this is great. Right. It, it talks it talks my language. I love this. I didn't have to add any developers or anything to learn new skills. It just worked. But then as they get used to it, they're like, hey, uh, what else does it do? And like, hey, well, it's got this native protocol that can be twice as fast if you have a lot of bandwidth available. And so we've actually started to see um, companies like there's a, a company called GB Labs. GB Labs is a video editing tool and for media workflows. And they've integrated the S3 gateway for uploads, but they did the native storage Web3 integration for their downloads because it's faster. I think we'll see this progression of adoption of people will try it because it's compatible and they don't have to work very hard and they just save money. And then over time, they'll see what else does DPN bring to the table. You just gave me so my so many ideas right now. Uh, where people can learn about the native protocols to use that because that's actually probably what I'm gonna do after recording this episode is like figure out how can instead of using Cyberduck we're gonna implement our own because I just love building this stuff. Yeah, so you can check it out on our documentation. So docs.storage.io. We've got all the information you need. You know, right up front is all the easy stuff to get started with the gateway, and then you can explore. You know, native protocol. You can look at our clone, and our clone will support both the native and the, the S3 gateway out of the box, you can set them up concurrently and you can test them independently. And then our clone has all those other benefits, like you can use our clone mount or you can use some of those other things. So if you want to get that um, that compatibility layer, you can get that as well. So it, it really comes down to, you know, like a, a lot of things, it's, a, it's sort of, it's cool for the sake of cool in some use cases where you just want to try Web3 stuff, but there are enterprises who are getting real value out of that, that capability because there are, you know, performance benefits you can get. You can implement both server-side encryption or end-to-end -end encryption, depending on your security needs. So there's a lot of flexibility in the kit. The access management stuff is really unique in the market. But ultimately, you know, everybody starts with a gateway, they get going, and then they're hooked. Yeah, I use our clone for a lot of things and backups and things like that. I didn't know that you can do that. So I'm going to definitely check after because I've been using just S3 because that's standardized, you know, and then it, that's... But I love that, like, that's how we get started and then realize that, there are much cooler things that you can do with that, and then you go from there. Let's talk a little bit about the the token storage. I don't think you, I don't know if you can talk about that, but let's. What do you want to know about the token? I'm happy to answer questions for you. How do you see the like the tokenomics helping the ecosystem and facilitate people getting maybe onboarded or getting people to give their hard disks in terms of the supply side of things? I think the storage token is probably one of the best examples of a utility token on the market, and the the. The easiest example of this is we have 25,000-ish storage nodes running. They're in 105, 107 different countries, and they're operated by somewhere around 10, 11,000 different people or companies. And if we had to do payments to those people in any kind of Web2 format, you know, in all of those countries, all of those jurisdictions with all of those banking rules, right? And some of them are, as people get started, those are micropayments. The payment transaction costs alone and complexity pretty much make our business model a non-starter. But having an ERC-20 compatible token allows us to do the value transfer easily, quickly, and in a way that it, that is fully transparent to the entire network. There, I don't think there is any other payment mechanism that would work beyond token as well and as efficiently in this use case. And we built the storage network to be decentralized, but the actual storage is decoupled from a blockchain, right? So it, it, that's what makes it able to be really, really fast. But the blockchain for payment um, and transfer, value transfer, is absolutely phenomenal. Um, I think we're probably still a couple of years away from seeing larger 
you know, adoption on the, the demand side of people paying in token for, for storage. There's a benefit to, uh, to the network. You get more storage capacity when you pay with token on the service. But, you know, I think really it's, uh, it's an enabler for the service at all to exist, right? If anybody anywhere can participate in the cloud economy with just an ERC-20 compatible wallet and a simple uh, extra hard drive and bandwidth, right? So it's really the great value of deep in architectures plus an incentive system that, that really make the whole thing work. So I'm, I'm a big fan of, of you know, the, the whole decentralized ethos and ecosystem, but I'm also very practical. And in this particular case, like it just works and it solves a very specific problem in a really differentiated way. Peak is a layer one blockchain designed to power DPINs. Why do DPINs choose to build on Peak? It's fast, scalable, low cost offer builders are ready to deploy a DPIN SDK and it's multi-chain. So when you build on Peak, you're building for all Web3. Peak is home for the fastest growing DPIN projects with more than 100,000 vehicles and devices deployed, over a dozen DPINs already building and the world leading device manufacturers such as Boss partner with them. Think of building a DPIN, Peak has a grand program for DPIN builders. If you're listening to this, remember, you're early. The Peak Network will launch in the first half of 2024. Check out Peak's channels for more details and links in the podcast description. Yeah, and I think as well, there's like you can have much more, like you said, easier payment everywhere in the world. And especially in countries that maybe $5 can make a big difference. Everyone has a computer that has like some hard disk capacity idle, right? So those people can make some extra income as well. It's, it's a really, really beneficial and can change a lot of lives on that sense. Can you bring a little bit about the story? Because uh, you guys started, I mean, it's a Ethereum mainnet project. And I remember at one point we were doing the payments in Ethereum, like just the Ethereum network, but then the gas fees start getting expensive, right? Because I remember like, you know, Ethereum got was beautiful, everything was cheap. And then the first, like the first cycle after Ethereum was released, that was, things got really expensive. And then you guys changed for, I don't remember, ZK Sync, uh, ZK, the, do you remember anything about that transition? I mean? Yeah, absolutely. I remember right when I joined, uh, it was like, oh my gosh, this Ethereum thing is great. Look at how low these transaction fees are. And within six months, CryptoKitties launched. Like remember cryptocurrencies, like the first sort of thing that 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 you that that got people to go click the button, and uh, gas fees and and transactions fees went like through the roof because they just saturated the network for two months, and that's when we started looking for a variety of different solutions, and we found you know a few people who were doing like the the sidechain rollups, and those solutions at that point in time were completely not mature, right? They they were like early, early stage stuff. And, you know, even at that time we were doing, you know, 10, 20,000 nodes payments a month. And, and it was just at that scale, those things kind of tipped over a little bit. And fast forward a couple of years as, as sort of the, those networks matured, a number of projects brought really good ZK rollup side chains to the market. And those have been great for us. And we've seen good steady as op- adoption of ZK sync in terms of paying nodes, right? The transaction fees are lower. We've had to adapt our payment methodologies and implement a lot of changes to, to the tokenomics to, you know, sort of work around spikes in gas fees because it's, you know, it, you can't pay a, a token operator $2 if the gas fees are also a dollar, right? That's, that starts to get a little bit insane. But ZK Sync has really been a very beneficial in terms of reducing those fees for the, the node operators that, that have adapted. And uh, we continue to see good adoption of those technologies. But yeah, it's super critical that, that we continue to make progress on, on transaction fees. Now the merge was great, right? Uh, EIP-1559, like these changes have done a ton to sort of stabilize transaction fees and, and really keep those down. But yeah, this is this is a thing that, that we track pretty closely because it's a significant element of COGS. and. Uh, they had the roll up uh, uh, with uh, zk sync has been phenomenal uh we deployed zk sync era and you know continue to work on on the uh the demand side with that and it's it's been very solid yeah that's good yeah i remember because at that time i was like man these guys must be paying more on transaction fees and they're actually paying the people you know so it was definitely a, a, an interesting solution on that end do you have some real world applications or case studies that people are using storage for 
their backup needs or also on the supply side, I can imagine. We have some really interesting use cases. And, and the interesting thing in DPIN is more than any other aspect of Web3, DPIN is relevant to both Web2 and Web3, right? Everybody needs infrastructure. And low cost infra infrastructure is super attractive. You know, with, with Helium, as you know, right? You get a Helium SIM and, and you just get a, a, a cell phone that pays for itself, right? That, that doesn't exist outside of Web3. And similarly, um, we see adoption in Web3 and Web2. So Web3, the, the, probably the most interesting examples are integration with LivePeer. So LivePeer is a live streaming uh, video transcoding service that's 100% uh, built with a decentralized backend. Their architecture is very similar to storage. And uh, so StorageA has, has done an integration with LivePeer where we have an end-to-end -end video transcoding and live streaming solution. So 100% of your workflow is fully decentralized. And that service is excellent. We have num a number of joint customers that are doing multiple petabytes of streaming per month. And it, it does a fantastic job for them. The other thing that we've got is, you know, similar to uh, what you're doing with the, the Deepin uh, Hub, we have a uh, service called Chainsnap. And we, we launched Chainsnap with Anchor to basically be a place where you can download blockchain chain state snapshots. And so now we're opening up Chainsnap to more providers so that we can have a really much more decentralized marketplace for people just to go and get chain state snapshots when they want to spin up a new blockchain node quickly. On the Web2 side, it's an entirely different set of customers. So we have everything from mainstream backup providers. There's a company called CloudWave. CloudWave's uh, one of the larger hospital MSPs in the U.S. They service 180 different hospital systems around the country, and they store their backups on StorJ. We have a number of companies in the um, uh, media entertainment space, uh, GB Labs that I mentioned earlier, Shadow Magic, Iconic, all of these companies that are in the space of doing media workflows, right? So editing, rendering, you know, doing backgrounds for videos and then assembling those for, for production. We have a, just a ton of different companies in there because we have this interesting behavior of our network that because we're distributing data globally, if you upload a file in Seattle and you download it in Frankfurt or New York, the performance is going to be very, very similar within a few percentage points difference, right? Because it's globally consistent performance. When you're doing this with Amazon, typically you have to upload a copy in Seattle and then replicate to New York and then replicate again to Europe to get that same level of performance. And that comes with a huge price tag. And so that, that behavior is really useful when you have these distributed teams who are editing videos, which is fantastic. So we'll be at, at NAB, the National Association of Broadcasters event in uh, Vegas in about two weeks. And that is the largest trade show for the media and entertainment industry in, in North America. And so we'll be you know, at the booth, meeting with customers and partners in that space. That's a great place for us to, to get new business and grow the network. And last year, we Storage A won a Product of the Year Award in the storage category. So like web free project wins in web two conference, mainstream conference. And that's, you know, that's where like Amazon is there. Wasabi is there. Backblaze is there. Like all of the providers are there. And we were like, yeah, that's right. We got the award. Thank you very much. Uh, so, you know, that was really an exciting thing for us. So yeah, uh, the, uh, I would say probably about 80% plus of our growth right now is just Web2 companies switching off of Amazon, Microsoft, IBM, Wasabi, and Backblaze, right? Which is crazy for the for the uh, the Web3 space. And, you know, these, these are companies who are bringing real dollars into the Web3 ecosystem, which I think is absolutely critical and, and where DPIN is really uh, differentiated. Wow, man, this, this is amazing, like uh, with the awards, especially with like bigger companies, like, or at least bigger well-known companies right now right on the space yeah you guys have been killing it and and of course one of the biggest media companies in the world which is Deepin hub is using storage to host a lot of their files as well right oh, yeah. and now the podcast right they're huge uh, yeah deep in they're huge taking yeah, over getting taking over uh but we definitely i'm going to look into the live peer thing that you mentioned because like if you can shift for our current the supplier for our podcast mp3 files i'm going to definitely when you use live peer, that's like, uh, we're already shifting everything for you guys anyway. I think that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, just they're growing in Web 2 also. They'll be at the booth with us at NAB. So like two main, like huge uh, uh, Web 3 projects, you know, taking on web, a Web 2 event. Like it's, that's probably one of the more exciting things for me is seeing that growth this year. Yeah, slowly, right? Like I, I think, for example, this year, 
CES has a lot of, had a lot of deeping projects about, you know, like GeoNet, Demo, and then slowly, I think the Web3 is going to take over a lot of those events. I think next year, uh, the CES, we're going to hopefully going to be there as well, supporting a lot of other deeping projects. And yeah, I think it's just a matter of time that we're going to be like the same, same or bigger, right? I think that's just, there's no, there's no stopping us now. <laughs> How does StoreJ then support users like developers uh, who wants to build on top of the like a Web3 application? Because you said you have like the native protocol. Uh, is there any other incentives other than just the documentation? Yeah, so we have, you know, all of the kit that works with, um, with Web2 also works with Web3. So a lot of developers just, you know, free, if you look at Web Web3 development, a ton of it takes place in Amazon today, all right? And so if somebody wants to just not just reduce their Amazon bill, but also maybe use some deep in in their service, this makes an easy way to do it, right? So there's there's no huge lift. There's no figuring out new tech. But then once somebody's moved over, you know, like we were talking a little, a little earlier, there's some really interesting stuff in terms of how we handle, you know, really privacy focused access management controls, right? They're very much aligned with the, the privacy uh, that, that Web3 is known for, right? And that confidentiality and that censorship resistance. We give a full set of tools for uh, web developers to build those capabilities in their applications. And then, of course, the ability to, uh, to build in any kind of instrument for the, the value transfer. Every storage project, you know, you can get started with swiping a credit card to make it accessible to uh, to Web2, but every project also comes with an ERC-20 compatible address. And so you can plug in any, uh, any DeFi instrument you want, any payment mechanism that you need to be able to, to sort of pay for the storage capacity and, and basically fund the nodes that are storing that capacity underneath any way you want. And so it really ends up just being sort of unique among the, the Web3 storage projects in that it's fast, reliable, durable storage. You know, it supports video streaming, you know, like whatever you're looking to hammer it with, it will meet that use case. Yes, I've been using with, like, I've been testing with Plex, like streaming some videos and it's been working. The, the, the encoding and everything has been like no problem at all. So it's like, it, it just, just works. And I think similar to what you were mentioning about the Helium Mobile, that you can earn points, earn like tokens by using it. It's the same thing with StarJ, right? You can like, I can plug a hard disk on my spare computer or Raspberry Pi or server at home. And then the amount that I'm earning, I can use for actually paying for the StarJ for files that I use personally or for my company or anybody else. So that's, it's a beautiful cycle, cycle of life, right? I would say on the Web3. Yeah, everybody's got a few hard drives sitting around, right? Everybody's got an old computer that they can spin up. Data centers have tons of, of stuff that's fully depreciated, sitting in racks that's just, you know, doing nothing that they can spin up and monetize. All of that stuff, no matter how old it is, makes great storage nodes because even though, I don't know, 60, 70% of our network is composed of spinning disk, when you aggregate all of that performance and you parallelize it across all those endpoints, you get screaming fast aggregated performance. And so we're able to use older hardware that people, you know, in a lot of like deep end projects, you have to buy mining rigs and expensive stuff and gone are the days with 0% interest financing on those things, right? And so you have to be thoughtful about what your ROI is going to be. Uh, but with storage, it's, it's a different model. We always started with the idea that we wanted to have a, a, an environmentally friendly aspect to this, which is take, take your parts bin stuff and operationalize it and get a lot more life out of it. Run it till it drops because... You know, I don't know, 60, 70% of the carbon footprint of a hard drive comes from its manufacturer. The rest of its lifespan is actually relatively low impact compared to its instantiation. So if we can avoid uh, creation of new hard drives, if we can you know, extend the life of those things, we're having a, a solution. And we've got a, a, a ESG white paper on our website that you can read all about it if you want. But it's it does produce a, a solution that is somewhere in the neighborhood of about 80% lower carbon footprint compared to something like an Amazon Web3 or S3. So yeah, it's uh, it's good kit and it's a great idea and people should bring their capacity to the network. Absolutely. I think I have a couple of more disks that are not doing anything. I should definitely plug into my StarJ node. Because like you said, as companies who have a lot of, a lot of data can really help with their like uh, environmental goals, maybe they can put like a stamp, like, okay, for all the data storage, we're, we're utilizing other like hard disks that would be just on someone's drawer, just, you know, collecting dust most likely. And you have to be paying Amazon on top of that. What on, on the, on the storage, like roadmap, is there anything guys, what are you guys focusing right now 
what are the main challenges they are trying to tackle and how do you see the project going forward? Yeah, so I think that there are, you know, there, there are some kind of things that sort of maybe sound a little mundane. Like we have uh, object versioning, which is an S3 feature for, for storage in uh, beta right now. Then that'll go live this year. And then we have object lock coming after that. And these are sort of like, oh, okay, these are just S3 features, you're on board. However, they do unlock, you know, billion dollar markets for the storage industry. So the number of backup applications that depend on those features being added, we work very well with those backup applications today, but then we can use a lot more of the feature set and be much more appealing to enterprise with those capabilities. We launched last year the ability to segment where your data is stored. So there's the global network of all the storage nodes, but then there are enterprises who are like, we like everything about that, except for we're a little nervous about who those nodes are and we don't know who they are. We're like, great, we'll give you a tier of storage that's only in SOC 2 certified data centers with whom you have a, a known relationship and we can restrict your data so that anything that, that is your data touches only SOC 2 certified infrastructure. And, you know, it's it's the same network, right? The same level of security and all of those things. But having those three little letters SOC for those guys makes them feel more comfortable with the solution. And so we're able to offer that capability. And I think we'll, we'll expand beyond, you know, geofencing to Europe and geofencing to the US and, and get more more capabilities with that this year. Um, I think the the ability to bring your own capacity. So if I'm an enterprise and I want to, I've got a bunch of extra hard drive capacity and I just, I want to turn it on and, and use that in conjunction with, with the cloud, or I have multiple data centers and I want to do a data center consolidation. These are features that, that we have all of the primitives to do. We're just turning them into uh, solutions for, for, businesses to operate. So I think there's a lot of a lot of just sort of grinding away and making a great storage product that's happening this year. And in the background, there's always a steady drumbeat of implementing minor code changes that result in big performance lifts. Because what we found over time was uh, when it was just cheaper, it wasn't interesting. When it was cheaper and just as durable and available and secure, still not interested. When it was faster, all of a sudden you have their attention because like there are things they care about. Dollars are becoming increasingly important, but speed, speed improves things like uh, RPO and RTO, recovery time objective, recovery point objective for backups. And so anything that we can do on an ongoing basis to increase speed, we found that that drives utilization like crazy. So those are the big things this year, just some mundane features that enterprises love and then performance, performance, performance. Trying to make it as boring as possible as well, right? I think it's an important one. Yeah, you know, that's the funny thing about DPIN, right? I mean, like DeFi took the world by storm, but it was really, you know, the interest was DeFi projects connecting to other DeFi projects, but not really bringing in mainstream workloads. And mainstream workloads coming in, what they want from infrastructure is like two words, just works, right? And if it just works, like that's that's that gets you in the door. And then you can talk about all the other things, but it has to be, it has to be just reliable and good because it's infrastructure. And sometimes that's boring, but man, it's great to see the kind of growth that we're seeing on just boring old infrastructure is pretty awesome. Yeah, I know. I'm like with the flag here, you know, like, let's go, guys. I love this thing. And I mean, that's one of the things that we're trying with the podcast as well is try to bring as many eyes as possible uh, to these projects because they're building something that really changes uh, the way that we see the infrastructure of the world. We see people making some passive income. And, and a lot of cool, cool things that makes me want to wake up in the morning every day and like, let's go, you know. For the people who have some spare capacity at home, where can they learn about how to get started with setting up their own node? So if they go to the, uh, the StoreJ website, there's a, a section there for, uh, for partners and there, there's a whole bunch of information on hosting a node, getting set up, there's tutorials. Those users can also join our community at forum.storj.io. And the community is full of people who will help them run their node, optimize their node, implement strategies if they want to run multiple nodes. You know, it's a it's a great and vibrant community, and we have uh, we are, we are very lucky to have that community in place because it's thousands of people all around the world who have expertise. They support multiple languages. Pretty much any anybody anywhere is going to find somebody who speaks that language who can help them get a node running, which is phenomenal. Well, uh, is there anything else that you'd like to tell the, our listeners about StarJ or about yourself or about anything? So I would say that, yeah, we are, we are live at a lot of events. And so if, you are, if you're interested in learning more about uh, StarJ and you want to meet up, we'll be at Google Next. We'll be at NAB. 
We'll be at Consensus. We'll be at uh, Globus World in Chicago coming up. So, you know, we are we are on the road, out there meeting with people all the time. So connect with us on Twitter, LinkedIn, our forum, whatever the best thing is for you. And, uh, you know, help us help Deepin take over the world. Let's do it. Well, thanks so much, John, for your your wise words and then telling us a bit about StarJ. We're going to be also at Consensus. We got invited by Coindesk for to represent the DeepIn ecosystem there. So I'm really excited to, to see, hopefully see you there and see the team as well. Yeah, everyone listening, make sure to check StarJ.io and run a node if you can. Make sure, I'm sure you have some spare hard disk at home. Uh, also follow DeepIn Hub podcast on YouTube or on Spotify or anywhere that you listen to us. And yeah, see you next time. Thanks so much for joining and it was a pleasure. Have a good one.